My name is Bina McLeod, and I'm the youngest child of eight. Uh, my mother and father are Don and Janet McLeod. Um, just recently, I've kind of been talking a little bit more about uh, where it all began for me. And if you watch the film today, um, that movement started in the late, the fishing by struggle started in the late 50s, early 60s. Um, for me, it began, and I always say that I was born a child of the movement when I was four years old. Because on October 13, 1965, we were going down to uh, Frank's Landing, that's where my father uh, was born and raised, for a peaceful protest. Um, had it turned out the way it would have, I don't think we would have been there because my father was very protective of that type of stuff. But on October 13, 1965, we're standing there, and most of us are women and children. And um, I go on what I remember, because I don't remember anything beyond this moment, but I remember watching um, my brother, he was there, and my other brother, my father, and a cameraman go out on a canoe. And the way that the Squally River grows, it grows over that, the trees grow over the river like that. And as we were standing there, and the canoe went out, um, the game wards came out from the brush, from underneath those, uh, the water and the brush and all over. And they began beating all of the people there, which were many women and children. And so I was four years old at that time. And so when I always reflect on that time, my life changed from that moment on. It totally changed on, on the person that I would become and how I would live my life. And the sacrifices made by my mother, you know, when we look back and we talk, yes, about Janet McLeod, she was a strong native woman. But there was a reason why she took that stand. There was a reason why she stood up and said, this isn't going to happen. And that was because of my father. She loved my father so tremendously, and he was the fisherman. And when she moved to this community, and she says, well, they used to come into her, the homes of the native people there and say, well, we got a generic search warrant, so we're going to check your freezer and your refrigerator to see if you have any wild game or fish. And my mom was standing there one day, she says, well, is that legal? And they says, well, yes, it's just, you know, it's just a generic search warrant we use. And she began to think about that, you know, and think about it. She began to study and, and study those type of things to realize that they were wrong. But the real awakening came, my brother tells the story, the real awakening came when my father actually went to um, World War II. And he was, in, uh, he was in Japan and around that area, and he was on the, the ship where the treaty was signed. And he said, hey, wait, we have treaties. You know, so he came home and together they began to research that. And so the involvement of my parents came to be, it came to be to fruitation. And, and, um, and I'm always thankful, I'm always thankful for that moment because anywhere I travel in Indian country, anywhere I go around this world, the first thing they ask is, did you bring fish? <laughs> did you bring smoked fish? But you couldn't ask that question to us had that stand not taken place back in 1965. Right. You know, you couldn't say, you got fish. And so whenever I'm partaking in smoking the fish or helping my brother or we're helping each other to do this and we share it with the people wherever we travel, I think about that day and I give a little thanks to those people who sacrificed their families, some of them their lives, that we might partake in that. And we always laugh because, because we had to learn that. And sometimes I'll be talking amongst my siblings and I'll say, and we'll, we'll, we'll listen to people talking about the tradition or the way of life. And I said, I don't recall as a child waking up saying, well, today I'm going to partake in my traditions. It was, there's a hunter fish out there, you guys need to get out there and, you know, take care of it. And I'm glad this day, because it really boils down to the simple way of life that we fail to see when we get caught up in these cities, and we get caught up in these casinos, and our kids are caught up in drugs, and we ask, how can we help them? And we have to try and bring them back to the simplicity of who we are as a people and our connection to the earth, our connection to our way of life, our connection to the water, to the land. And we have to be a reminder to our children to say, you know, this is who we are as a people. 
Because we find out, and I'm finding out, and I know it's been prophesied by my elders, that the casinos will be the, the final stage for our people. It will be the downfall of our people. Because we're, as we get into the money and the money comes in, we inch a step further and a step further to assimilation. And we become. And so when you look in the communities, and it's ironic because we don't understand our history, the oppressed have become the oppressor. And so you're looking at that and you're saying, wait, now we have to battle this within our own communities. Yeah. And our children, and they lie in wait because these casinos, they make big payouts to these kids. And you can guarantee that he's already into that drug dealer. That's the first place he goes when he gets his money. And they tell us, and they fear, I don't want to get my money. They're waiting for me. They're waiting for me. And everybody's waiting to offer him something that he, they think he needs. And so, yeah, when you look at the fishing rights struggle, and yes, you look that we can still partake in that, we may have won the battle, but when my dad used to define the judge vote decision as 50% of nothing is nothing, or look at it in the other retrospect, they, they took 50%, because at one point we had 100%. <laughs> you know, so when you look at it in those contexts. And so, the, so today, when you're looking at it, and sitting there talking with my sisters and saying, we need to come together as mothers, mothers who are taking our children in and out of treatment centers, in and out of detox, in and out of counseling, and say, okay, there's something missing. There's something missing. And sometimes when I come out and I look and I come travel to places like this and I think of the, the simplicity and, and, uh, and uh, the events that may have happened here and the history that this, if the walls could talk, you could tell stories in this building. But that's the battle we look at today. It's, it's within our own communities, within our own leadership. You know, and I was going through some of the papers and pictures to bring down here, I found uh, the warning message that my mother had written. And there was three signs she saw. One was our threat to sovereignty. The other was the leadership. I can't remember what the third one was, but the leadership in regards to where they're going today and where they're taking our people and how our people are blindly following. But the sovereignty, and I remember she used to have little 10 acres in Yelm, and she used to say, this is my sovereign piece of land, because nobody can tell me how to live on this land. And I had the pleasure of traveling. My brother and I went to New York, Onondaga, uh, at the beginning of the month. And it brought back everything that was so real, because that is really, truly a sovereign piece of land there. No government can go in there. It's sovereign. But the beautiful thing was everybody in the nation was provided for it. Everybody was provided for. Everybody had a job. Everybody did whatever they could do to provide for the nation, and everything was shared amongst the nation. And it's still happening in that community. But if you were today say, well, let's go back to community living, I can tell you it's really hard. You know, I have my sister staying with me, and I love my sister dearly. But we don't live together like families live together at one point, where everybody just took care of each other. You know, it's really hard to bring two women into one house and say, wait, you know. <laughs> but, but, you know, it's, and we forget that simplicity of, of how life is. And I guess if, if the message is and the resistance is, is to go back. Go back to the roots of who you are as a people. Because, because we follow this path, you know, you have the pictures of the Hopi prophecies here, you know where that goes. 